I want to welcome everyone back to the Picanona show. Thomas is here and um, part three of the Balkans. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for hosting me. Of course. Some people got upset thinking that I wasn't telling the Serbian side of the story. I mean, that wasn't my intention at all. Like, I got kind of irritated and I wasn't feeling very well. So if I said some things that upset people, I mean, in response to some of their complaints, I, I wasn't trying to be obtuse. The reason why I focused on the Croatian side is for a few reasons. The, the whole raison d'etre of what the State Department did, even after, even post Bush and Baker, albeit though the Clinton administration like went about it in kind of a, an illiterate way in terms of their rationale. I mean, like the military in those days was still pretty, they had their, their stuff together operationally. But to understand why Helmut Kohl did what he did, to understand what the view was from Washington, you've got you've to look at what the Croatians were doing. Okay, that's why. Today, I'm going to take up what the Serbian case was and why it was entirely misguided for them to be accused of starting the war, because they absolutely didn't. Um, I mean, that, that's, that's ass on any way to claim that you know, an ethnic conflict is like a schoolyard fight and, and some party combatant, it's always oh, their fault. That's not how things work. And even though he, even though he doesn't gain a lot of sympathy, I mean, even from like his own people, like I, I found Slobodan Milosevic to actually be quite a sympathetic figure. What was done to him at the Hague, he was quite literally killed by being put on trial. And I mean, that, that was grotesque. Um, I've actually always considered myself to be pretty sympathetic to the Chetnik cause. I mean, not, not because I find common cause with it, but I mean, I, I'm sympathetic to anybody who, you know, whose, whose ambition is to redress the historical grievances of their people in, in a way that guarantees their posterity in the future. So today we're going to get a little bit into like the Serbian situation as it was in 1991 and why, you know, Milosevic was basically somebody who was, he was the only, as a head of state, other than Jaruzelski, who doesn't really count, he was the only, he was the only communist functionary who remained in an executive role after the inter-German border collapsed, which is interesting. So this idea that he was some arch Chetnik genocidal maniac, I mean, that, I mean, that, that's, that, that's just, that's that's a propaganda narrative anyway, but you know, were that were those his stripes, I mean he wouldn't he he wouldn't have enjoyed the posterity he did, which should be obvious, but we'll get into some of that stuff today. And um hopefully people will realize I'm not you know trying to assign blame to any party combatant or any side. I mean, I, I don't do that anyway. I mean, there's rare, one of the reasons why the Ukraine situation is bizarre is because it's a rare case of quite literally a conspiracy to provoke an irrational war. That almost never happens, you know, but even in that case, obviously there's, there's conditions on the ground that make that possible. It's not just some sort of spontaneous contrivance or conspiratorial design made real, because that's not that's not how political affairs develop. But um the third Balkan war, Misha Glenny, he's a guy who I don't particularly like. I mean he's he's basically he's kind of like a typical like globalist liberal, but <clears throat> He did actually write about the only apologia for the Serbian people that, that got like mainstream um, promotion, which is interesting. <clears throat> so he's more complicated than um, some of his declared positions on, on sociological things would suggest. He assigns the onset of the third Balkan war, which is what we, you know, People in the West lump it. To, people in the West lump the uh, the homeland war, like the Bosnian war and the Kosovo conflict, into like one one conflict. I understand why. I understand why they do that, even if it's in in complete shorthand for what really is you know three discrete conflicts that derive from a common nexus of causality. But something that shouldn't be controversial. June twenty fifth, nineteen ninety one. That's 
that's when hostilities arrived in the Balkans within the conflict cycle that is referred to as the Third Balkan War in at least in Anglophone countries. That was the date that the Republic of Slovenia, which led the charge towards secession, it wasn't the Croats initially. I mean, I think they would have anyway. I mean, it's an open-ended question, but they're the ones who who took that step that there to for, you know, um, Tujman for all of his talk of creating a truly Croatian Republic that like reflected, you know, the, the singular and, and, and exclusive culture of the Croatian people. I mean, he didn't make that move. Okay. Until after the Slovenians declared independence. After the Republic of Croatia did, um, the Yugoslav People's Army, which was Serbian-led. Some people attacked me for suggesting that the security apparatus was Serb-heavy. Yugoslav National Army was, it wasn't overwhelmingly Serbian, but the majority of general officers to the tune of about 60 to 70 percent were ethnic Serbs. Like, that, they can't be denied. What their sympathies were, I mean, that I, I can't tell you. I mean, I'm sure it varied. I mean, but the the fact of their majoritarian status can't be denied okay um the yugoslav army invaded slovenia and that was really when the die was cast now the state department claim as well as what was pontificated about on the floor of the united nations which in those days on the heels of the gulf war the u.n still had clout which seems strange today but there was this big hope that the UN was going to finally fulfill its, you know, intended function since the Cold War was over. And now the the, the, the reasoning was that, you know, decision making is no longer going to be colored by these these kinds of strategic exigencies, you know, and now the sort of community of nations is going to emerge, you know, and and work towards like a truly totally globalized collective security. That's asinine, in my opinion, for all kinds of reasons. But that was the belief and coming off of the Gulf War, which really, even more so than the Korean War, because I mean, the Korean War, the Soviets were boycotting the Security Council, and so was, and so were a bunch of their client states. Um, it, like this, one one of Bush's master strokes was the Gulf War, and it wasn't just a military operation executed with Prussian efficiency. There was truly like a quorum of, of 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 civilized nations, as it were, including the then still extant Soviet Union. So, when things went to hell in Yugoslavia, everybody, whether you know from Berlin to Paris to London to Tokyo to Washington, was oh well, this is a UN matter. We'll come to some sort of we'll come to some sort of you know solution there, and we'll get into that in a minute, but. Because, in my opinion, conceptually, even people don't realize they're doing it, and even that coterie of of national leadership that was in place in 1991 globally, even the more sophisticated among them, they were still sort of drunk on their own rhetoric, which for decades by that point had been derived from, you know, the judgment levied at Nuremberg. They still were they still were operating according to this idea that well warfare has aggressors and victims or you know it has people who strike first and people are defending themselves so i think a genuine prejudice set in against the chetnik cause for a lot of reasons but initially the claim was oh you know the yugoslav people's army that that's a serbian that that's a serbian military force in all but name so when the Yugoslav National Army intervened in Slovenia, the claim was, oh, this is an example of Serbia identism, you know, and that's that's that that that's what's causing all of this. And of course, Newsweek, which and Time magazine and all these kind of print media outlets, which in those days too, I mean, this is when legacy media was arguably at zenith, they started running these stories about, you know, ethnic cleansing and mass rape in Bosnia. And the framing of the narrative was, well, this is all happening because of Serbia identism, you know, and, and Slobodan Milosevic is this mad dictator. And the only way he's hanging on to power is because he's taken on a Chetnik guise. None of which makes any sense. 
And for context, at the beginning of 1991, Yugoslavia, which still existed, it was a federation of six republics. It was Serbia, Croatia, Slovenia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Montenegro, and Macedonia. Plus, there's two autonomous provinces, Vojvodina and Kosovo. The eight major ethnic populations that lived in those regions, they approximately correspond to the political divisions of the federation. And this was by design. Um, and in each region, there could, each region could claim an ethnic concentration that corresponded to their national signifier, but there were there were deep minority populations in all of these loci. Now, one big weakness in the narrative, I mean, there's many, okay, but one big weakness in the narrative of Serbs going crazy is that not 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 all Serbs lived in the geographic region arbitrarily designated Serbia. There were 600,000 Serbs lived in Croatia. The majority of these were urbanized. And it went so far as Tujman, for all, I, I've got a lot of respect for Tujman and for all of his sophistication as a statesman. And he was a military veteran, but he was basically an academic. And he hung around, the Serbians he hung around were in Zagreb. Or they were cosmopolitan types, uh, you know, who we'd met in like university life. And there was uh, the urbanized Serbs in Zagreb. They had a symbiotic relationship with their Croatian neighbors. Like how much of this owed to the fact that they were the minority. And when you're a minority, you toe the line. That's an open-ended question. But there was even a portmanteau called Herbie, which... Uh, it's a it's a conflation of Hrvati, which means Croats, and Serbi, which means Serbs. So this was like a thing, all right? But the core of kind of Serbian identity and patriotism in Croatia, it was rural. It was concentrated uh, in broad swaths of the countryside. Um particularly in Kinin or Kinin, which was once for context in the medieval period, that's like through like the Habsburg era, that's where Croatian kings were uh, coronated. Okay. It became a militant home of Serb nationalism. Okay. It's very impoverished. People's fortunes and outcomes are very limited even today. It's also on the path literally to um Dalmatia, which is essential. It's a life's blood of Croatia and like the Balkans in general. Okay. Um, for obvious reasons. You know, that's that's the uh that's the ingress and egress of the Adriatic Sea. Um these rural Serbs really for the I mean they these were the these were the guys who were then elderly and the descendants of guys who'd who'd fought with you know, than the hail of its Chetniks. You know, like they, they didn't suddenly become cosmopolitans who wanted to live in some Croatian republic. And Tujman, now mind you, he's a guy who came up through the Titoist apparatus. So it's not like he was like some arch Ustasha or something, and he wasn't a fascist, despite what people claimed in Belgrade and what a lot of left wingers claimed in Germany and elsewhere. But he did draw upon a lot of Ustasha symbols. And he did say, like, we're not going to run from our, like, you know, from our heritage in the independent state of Croatia. You know, basically people who said they wanted some sort of disavowal of the state, he's like, fuck you. <laughs> and, uh, you know, um, <clears throat> the Tujman regime started doing things, you know, like only conducting official business in the Western alphabet. Okay, Serbs use Cyrillic. And this isn't a small thing. Okay, like, even if you speak the same common language you know even even a dialect that's pretty similar if suddenly if suddenly you go outside and like you, you know the government's not conducting business in an alphabet you can read you're gonna feel pretty fucking marginalized you know um and even beyond that it like symbolically it it um it made the service feel not just profoundly disrespected but when you consider that an active war was on you know, the uh, the Slovenes, um, 
as well as uh as well as both the Bosnian Croats and the Bosniaks, you know, the Bosnian Muslims, who in the next episode will we'll get into their story a bit if if that's agreeable. You know, they were they were looking around themselves saying like there's 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 an ethnic war on. You know, this isn't hypothetical anymore. There's a shooting war going on between ethnic secessionists and the Yugoslav army, which at least at the general officer level is majoritarian Serb. And Tujman now is saying that Croatia is a state exclusively for the Croatian people, um, the only democracy that's valid. And Tujman did run a, a, um, a democracy. There were contested elections. That's inarguable. However, as a matter of constitutional mandate, you know, the newly independent Croatia was exclusively Croatian. You know, and if you didn't identify that way, you better start. Otherwise, you know, you're not one of us. Um, and the jump from that in the uh, wake of a, a Rosenkrieg, which has actually already jumped off, albeit in a different theater, but still, you know, local to where you live, you're going to realize that you could very well find yourself ethnically cleansed. And the guys pointing the bayonet at you could be guys who you were totally at peace with, you know, a, a year ago or a month ago or a day ago, you know. And people think that's not possible, like even in America. Obviously, I'm not comparing the two situations, but like when the Floyd bullshit jumped off, that's uh, right before I got off probation, like right before I got back on the internet. And I was like, I was living in, in this like ghetto YMCA that was like 80% black. And I was like, okay with those guys. But I realized I like, get the worst of it. I'm like, you know, if things get like really bad, like these guys aren't going to be my friend. You know, like, and it's, I think most people don't think that way in this country. And I mean, I am a minority here. I mean, thankfully not in my town, but in the, the municipality, I'm like a minority of one. But I mean, so this idea that, oh, those people just went crazy, like your neighbors wouldn't fucking whack you. Yeah, they would. <laughs> I mean, like even here, let alone in a place um, if things are bad enough. You know, I'm not saying people should be paranoid or something or, you know, order mac and cheese buckets from Alex Jones and, you know, pretend that a fucking apocalypse is coming. But this idea that, you know, politics can't turn on you because, oh, we there was some kind of concord with my neighbors and they like me like that's. All bits are off in 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 in, in, a, in, a, in a Ross and Krieg or, or or whatever equivalent is, you know. So that's that's basically um that's basically what the perception was. And Yugoslavia, like a lot of the satellite states, you know, one of the reasons why East Berlin was so important to the Warsaw Pact, it wasn't just because that was you know the westernmost frontier of the communist world. It was because of the communists especially because of their pretensions about, you know, the industrial proletariat and the degree to which they relied kind of upon these intellectual university types to kind of facilitate the program. You know, they, they really, it's like the countryside, like didn't exist to them, you know, and even people like Tujman, even though in Yugoslavia, I don't believe, I don't believe Titoism was ever a doctrine or kind of Marxist Leninism. But it definitely, the political culture definitely was similar in terms of its blind spots. And these guys, it's like, even in a small country, you know, it's like, it's like the countryside, you know, where, three, you know, 600,000 Serbs live, you know, who view life and the ethnic situation the same way they did in 1941. It's like, this didn't exist. It was like, oh, here in Zagreb, you know, we were all the same. And our Serb neighbors, you know, they might have funny customs, they go to the wrong church, but they can learn to be Croatian. Ha huh? Like there really is something to that. And um, you know, that that really can't be overstated. Um, you know, the uh so it was basically in Kanin or Kanin, and um basically what became the secessionist Ukraine Serb Republic. This is where the this is where the Croats actually could not afford if there to be some kind of iridescent Serbian movement or some kind of mobilized Chetnik response to what Zagreb was doing. That's the last place they could afford for this to happen. And that's absolutely where it did happen. And those also have to be the toughest Serbs who, who live in Croatia. That's where they lived. You know, um, 
the uh, so in the first month of Tujman's election, um, and again I emphasize that Tujman was elected. People can say whatever they you know it's kind of like I, people have become less friendly to Croatia, the Croatia of history, um, in academic treatments. You know now that we're like thirty years out, and you know they're they're increasingly casting Tujman as as some kind of dictator. I mean, the Croatian system to this day is a strongly presidential system, but Tujman was elected president in a normal election. You know, you can't, you, you can't just say you can't claim, you know, that, that like Russia is not a democracy. I mean, Croatia is as democratic as any other country on earth, okay? And it was in 1991, as it is today. Um, you know, and uh, in the lead up to Tujman's election, Again, it was his academic university friends who not only ran his campaign and sort of integrated his platform and, and his optics into a modern media apparatus of the kind that, you know, existed in the West. But these are the guys who were advising him on policy also, you know, and what he needed. I mean, frankly, he needed the defectors from the Yugoslav National Army who knew the situation in the military apparatus as it stood then, not 20 years ago. You know, he needed he needed guys who, who could tell him what the situation was on the ground, um, you know, in the countryside where, you know, when war came, I mean, that's not only where it's decided, but that's that's what Croatia would have to capture in order to remain viable as a state. Um, and, uh, the, uh, there was also two, the local cadres that facilitated Tujman's ascendancy in contrast to the people who constituted his cabinet. A lot of these guys were probably what would be viewed under normal conditions as extreme. You know, there were guys who for years or for decades in some cases that they were middle-aged. There were guys who'd basically been like carrying the torch of of Croat nationalism, you know, and biding their time until the Titoist regime could be torn down. These guys had a basic antipathy to Serbs. Like they, they can't be denied. You know, um, so if your ground organization are basically guys who hate Serbs anyway, it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what um, your control group is saying. It doesn't matter what Tujman, you know, playing mellow academic is talking about a conciliatory posture between populations. You know, I mean, it's not... Um, it's not it's not something it's not something that's that's gonna resolve in anything but a violent um separation now i i mean again like nobody's an auger and i think i think key political figures even people who had a better understanding or a more realistic understanding of the situation than than perhaps Tujman himself did, they couldn't have foreseen the extent of the differences and like the degree of, of the division and um, the kind of hostility just beneath the surface, like coming from both sides. Um, and when Tujman won the 1990 election, what he should have done, regardless of what he intended in terms of, you know, making the civic apparatus, you know, a, a truly, a, a, like a truly national, democratic, like exclusively crowd apparatus, like he absolutely should not have done anything provocative until it was clear where the cards were going to fall in in terms of secession and what the response from Belgrade was going to be. But at the same time, too, this is twenty twenty hindsight, and even a even in a relatively unfree country, which Croatia was not again, but even under conditions where an executive doesn't have to abide some sort of direct ballot mandate i mean every every chief executive is bound by the tenor of the of a uh, opinion in the body politic you know so i mean i tujman was in part being kind of carried on a current of uh of of zeitgeist that uh probably was irrepressible um 
and there's also i mean there's always there's always something of uh i mean you as as you know because of where you live now and compared to the locale of your birth and upbringing there's always some kind of disdain that the city has for the country like all these people they're they're just simple fucking people like they they're passive they're going to tolerate whatever we kind of put on them like that's never the case you know um and particularly not when there's a tradition of partisanship that breaks down rigidly on ethnic lines i mean like there was in croatia but um you know again a lot of this i think is out of I mean, i'm a hegelian a lot of this is out of man's hands um you know and it's also the uh one thing people did say at the time and uh, you know, Tito himself was a Croat, and he successfully suppressed Serb Croat enmity during the totality of his rule. But I mean, they, I think that's misguided too, man. I mean, one of the things is Tito, he derived his mandate not from the fact that Croats and Serbs suddenly decided they love one another. It's because the genius of Tito was he found a way to keep both Uncle Sam and the Soviets out, you know, and I mean, it, um, even the most even the most kind of sectarian minded ethnically chauvinistic minded Croat or Serb or Bosniak would realize that, you know, in, in uh, within this paradigm, you know, we stand together or we at least tolerate the situation as, as it is, or, 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 or we all die, you know, and I don't, I don't think that's entirely fair. Um, you know, and there were, there was other things too. I mean, the, this was documented. It wasn't just probably probably in from Belgrade, like, um, upon the ascendancy of, upon a two-month election, there was like a mass demotion and, and termination of Serbs from, from high and intermediate government positions. Um, you know, literary Croat, literary Croatian, it had to be spoken in administrative positions of officialdom. It wasn't just the Western alphabet had to be used by everybody, but you were basically prohibited from speaking with a Serbian accent. I mean, that that's, I mean, stuff, stuff like that is a flex, you know, I mean, it doesn't, um, there, there's no other way to characterize it. Um, <clears throat> and the, um, the failed, uh, conflict resolution model again. Um, I mean, frankly, uh, However, misguided in terms of the assumptions people held <clears throat> in 1991 about the potentiality of a truly sort of global collective security, at least thank God it was that coterie at the Department of State and not this current crop of insane Zionists and out and out, you know, mental subnormals. I don't even want to, I can't even imagine what that would play out, but the, um, the big, believe it or not, the big question was on the U in the UN General Assembly and the Security Council, like, is this an international conflict or is this a civil war? And that significance was key, okay, because the United Nations, misguided as it may have been, you know, philosophically to suggest that such a thing could be viable, the charter was written with an eye for restraint, in part because, you know, obviously Stalin's representatives had to be placated. And ironically, you know, as Yaki pointed out again and again, I mean, that actually had the effect of imposing restraint upon Washington dominating the world and facilitating a social engineering regime under the office of collective security. But um, the UN General Assembly, um, had no, they had they had no grounds to vote a resolution on a civil war, as regards you know sanctioning the the party combatants or directly inter or the and the UN Security Council had no grounds to intervene, you know unless there was an international dimension to the conflict, you know um, it would be suggested by people one of the reasons why in the era everybody loved to bandy genocide uh, and accuse people he didn't like of committing it was because arguably the genocide convention 
superseded um, the UN Charter as a, a de jure grounds for intervention if one accepts international law paradigms as legitimate. But um, obviously, uh, in 1991, um, it wasn't credible to talk that way. I mean, it wasn't particularly in subsequent years, but you can't levy you, you can't levy an, an accusation of genocide within like months of the onset of hostilities. Like it's that it, obviously be a propaganda ploy. But um, you know, Belgrade, which t Belgrade at the time it was, and really until. Uh, the conclusion of hostilities, um, the uh, the Serbians identified as the Union of you you know the Yugoslavian Union of Serbia and Montenegro. You know they never claimed like oh we are Serbia we're you know we're creating you know like an ethno national state of Serbians mirroring Tuđman. They claimed Yugoslavia is you know we're the Yugoslavian government and secession is against the law. You know, these people are engaged in um they're they're waging war on, on on the sovereign government of Yugoslavia, you know, which is uh which is uh which, which is both illegal and as well as an internal affair, you know. Um and that was key. The uh until the end, the official position of Belgrade was that this is a civil war, you know, and Yugoslavia never ceased to exist, you know, and the people are claiming that it's a dead letter that Yugoslavia is kaput our our fascists who have, you know, a, a racialized view of, of, of high politics. Um like however dishonest that may have been, um, depending on your perspective. I mean it it it, it was it you know, Serbia never seceded. Serbia never claimed that the Yugoslavian constitution was null and void. That we're reconstituting as a Serb republic. Kraina did constitute itself as, as the Republic of the Republic of Serbia. But you know, this is this is important. It's not just legalese. It had real war and peace impactfulness. Um but it's also the uh I mean the key the key shortcoming of the United Nations in executive terms, I and mean, aside from the fact, however much philosophically these things aren't viable i mean what 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 are you and blue that's going to do are they going to are they going to occupy are they going to occupy bosnia and assault the yugoslav army with combined arms i mean no one's ever been able to explicate how this works and even in situations like in lebanon after 82 where the united nation deploys you know, the United Nations deploys um, permissively because all party combatants allow it to deploy. You know, I mean, it's not you, you're not you, you can't speak of international law when it's when, when categorically it can't be compulsory. So it's sort of paralysis set in, but it's also there's a broader problem that we touched on in the first episode. If the UN had come out and said this is an international conflict um just in absolute terms it's not a civil war you know that would have at this time there was still uh, a truly conciliatory posture towards the soviet union which was about to dissolve albeit but saying suddenly this is croatia versus serbia with bosnia caught in the middle and the bosniaks kind of just trying to survive it's like well Cole already immediately recognized the independent state of Croatia. You know, you'd essentially be sowing the seeds of a wider ethnic conflict between Germany and Russia, like each backing their client regime and a sort of a zero sum paradigm developing. I think that was underway anyway, but again, you've got to put yourself in the year 1991. You know, this wasn't. This wasn't accepted thinking. The idea was that this is sort of a blip on the path to, you know, a global collective security arrangement. People are still seriously talking about the Bush Baker model of we're gonna we're, we're gonna total the Soviet Union is gonna totally disarm its strategic nuclear forces and draw down 
its conventional force to Weimar levels. And like we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna withdraw from Germany and like NATO basically isn't gonna exist anymore. Like this was the way people were thinking, not just talking. So that's important to consider. Um you know, and again, the uh if um I think some of the uh I think some of what was alleged in terms of um ethnic cleansing and, and and mass rape and like organized like sexual violence some of that was overstated some of it was not okay um i'm really going to use the term war crimes because this this advantage so much the floating signifier has become meaningless but there is direct testimony that i i from you know ncos and, and junior officers who were witness to these events and they had no reason to lie about it and every reason to deny it. And I find that testimony persuasive. I and mean, these weren't guys who themselves were under indictment, you know. And I, I think anybody who doesn't believe those kinds of things happen in a Ross and Creed is being naive. And I think everybody agrees that that kind of stuff is horrible. But again, it's like, what do you, it's never been clear with the people who claim the UN should have, quote, done something. So, like, what do you do? You know, you deploy with combined arms and assault the, the Yugoslav army. So, like, now you're at war with Serbia. Like, I don't... The this idea that somehow you can enter a combat zone, like an active conflict zone, you know, with combined arms and, like, be like the police or something and people stop what they're doing. You know, like, you, you just become a party combatant when you do that. You know, you're, 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 you're joining a gunfight that you didn't have to. You know, um, and that's basically it. You know, it doesn't, there's not, um, there's not, there's not, there's not some equitable resolution because, oh, they represent the United Nations. You know, that's preposterous. Um, now, there was a claim, Bosnia Herzegovina. Which uh, I think everybody will agree was on the receiving end of, of the worst excesses by all by all party combatants. Um, under Article Twenty Five of the UN Charter, member states can vote to intervene in a conflict zone where to not intervene would be inconsistent with, you know, like the fundamental protection of human rights and things of this sort. The language is ambiguous, but the fact of the situation in Bosnia where arguably there was no majoritarian ethnos. And even if you disagreed with the idea that, you know, the Yugoslavian, the Balkan, the Third Balkan War was an international conflict. Obviously, whatever government head could be said to exist in Bosnia Herzegovina had totally broken down. Um, that would have been the best case if you were going to rely upon United Nations legal rationales to intervene. But again, like what what would that force have been made up of? You're, you're going to send like the Bundeswehr in there. So you got like a German army now marching in under the office of the UN saying, oh, but we're here, you know, to represent all nations. You're going to you know, the Russians a piece of that. Um, you know, again, like the the degree to which. Real politic emerged in earnest of a, of a sort that was somewhat more complicated than during the Cold War, just in terms of. The kind of conflict diets potentially that were emergent, like that can't be overstated too. I mean, so then it's some of you're left with, like, even if the political will is there, even if there's some sort of operational roadmap to resolve, uh, or you know, to, to enforce a ceasefire, like, who do you deploy? You're gonna get a bunch of, you're gonna get a bunch of like third world, like, like D listers from like Ecuador or or uh to you know to, to 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 police bosnia i mean that's on some level um you know there was kind of a hard lesson driven home 
about what a foolish move it was to destroy Europe and kind of like rob the its constituent states of sovereignty. Because if something like this happens, like you need a Habsburg Empire to intervene, or you needed Germany to intervene, or you needed Germany and a Russia to intervene and kind of decide among themselves what sphere of influence is. You know, people can say all they want, like, well, that doesn't matter if we're talking about the rule of law. It absolutely does matter, <laughs> you know, because like the human dimension always matters and we're talking about human affairs. So it was this kind of paralysis that, that just dragged on. And Lawrence Eagleburger, who I'm actually more sympathetic to than a lot of people. Um, I mean, I'm more sympathetic to him as a man. I mean, he's dead now, but and as well, I'm more sympathetic to him than a lot of the hoi polloi who say nasty things about him, not unlike David Kissinger. But he was undersecretary um, of state for a time in the Bush 41 administration. He said immediately the onset of hostilities, look, you've got to let this conflict cycle punch itself out. Because if you intervene, you're just going to upset the balance. You're going to drag out hostilities. You know, there isn't a solution. Basically, you know, the the new Croatia and the new Serbia and whatever the fate of Bosnia is, it's going to be decided on the battlefield. Um, and obviously he was, you know, raked over the coals in media, like, oh, how dare you say this? You're encouraging mass rape and genocide. I mean, no, actually, exactly what Eagleburger said, like, ended up happening in uh, 91 to 95. Um America intervened uh, to facilitate Operation Storm, which is the Croatian liberation of the Kraina, um, which, you know, was the uh, belated victory in the homeland war for Croatia. Um, but that was, uh, that was only the, that was only the, that was, America facilitated that by use of a PMC outfit called MPRI, which was incorporated essentially for that purpose, you know, for the, for an operation in Croatia, um, which is very interesting. And in the final episode, we'll get into that, but basically, um, you know, for all the talk about how what Eagleburger was saying was, was horrifically callous. I mean, that what it came down to was, um, what what resolved the conflict, uh, the ninety one to ninety five conflict cycle was exactly what he said. You know, the the party combatants exhausted um, their ability to wage war, um, and uh, battlefield a battlefield victory in Crimea, albeit with you know American assistance, is is what resolved for all time the the disputed um or the contested uh objective uh that was crying you know. so i hope um hope people will back off a bit on saying that like i hate serbs or i'm saying bad things about them or that i i've got some conceptual bias in favor of croatia we should talk a little bit about slow down well, it's, it's i mean it, it, it's been a lot of people's lifetimes. You know? Yeah, and I understand why yeah. if I was a Serbian um and I was in America or the UK, like I'd feel very much like uh, a population designated for hostility. You know, um I understand that completely. Okay, but um I don't think people one of the one of the reasons I focus so much on the Third Reich is because the international system and the entire sort of conceptual horizon that's been crafted around World War II, you've got to deal with the Third Reich as sort of like the primary like agent, like in that narrative. Okay. Um so I'm not I'm not just like fixated on these things. At a smaller scale, if you're talking about if you're talking about the Yugoslavian wars. Or what or what you know the um the third balkan war at least the 91 95 phase that led to the creation of an independent croatia like you've got to deal with the croatian political culture and what and, and basically you know what 
the West's view of Croatia was and what Tutman was doing. That's what was the dispositive variable. Okay, so like I begin with discussing the Croatian situation. Also, because Croats or are like German adjacent and thus like Western adjacent, I frankly know more about them than I do Serbians. But um, in my defense, again, um, what was happening in Zagreb, and uh, it wasn't the sole proximate cause of the conflict. But it was it was the essential cause. Okay, um, the what Croatia did decided the course of the war, and the uh, ultimately what became the political resolution, like where like when the shooting stopped, you know the the frontiers were established and accepted. It wasn't what Slovenia or Macedonia was doing. It wasn't what the Bosniaks were doing. Like those things had an impact, but again, like that's why. So um. I mean, I, I would have dealt with the Serbian perspective anyway, but I thought it was especially imperative um, to do so for for that reason. But um, Milosevic himself, I mean, again, he was you know, he was a career communist apparatchik. He rose to a general secretary position or equivalent around 1987 and actually the late Reagan administration looked at him as their guy. Like he was going to be like this big liberalizer. Like he was basically the, he was supposed to be like the Yugoslavian Gorbachev. Okay. Um, that's one of the ways he got swept into power and was able to consolidate his authority the way that he did, you know, like, so this, I, this kind of, this ex post facto rationalization, you know, that really began in earnest in, 91 and kind of just when it became totally irrational and punitive during the Clinton regime that Milosevic is like this madman like Chetnik like that's completely at odds with reality and history like the he 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 was this big like liberal moderate that's how he enjoyed the kind of patronage that he did um it uh and honestly you know Milosevic's fall from grace and power within his own country Kostunich uh, was elected president on October 5th, 2000. And part of the big, the big reason why Kostunich, or Kostunich, uh, if forgive me if I'm butchering the pronunciation, one of the big reasons why he was able to break through is because he was a Serb nationalist. And Milosevic, the big criticism of Milosevic within Serbia was he turned his back on the, on the Serbian war refugees. He didn't care about our people. You know, he didn't fight hard enough, you know, for the for the for the coast of our Serbs. You know, like he he wasn't this big Chetnik. You know, like he was basically pragmatic. And um this claim that you know most of the most of the grossest excesses, wherever one falls in their sympathy or background or whatever, I don't think anyone would disagree that the worst excesses carried out by all party combatants took place in Bosnia. Okay. And the idea that from Belgrade, Milosevic was somehow directing like the Bosnian Serbs to do his bidding, like that's just not, I mean, that's not the way command authority works in a, in a modern state. But it's also like the Bosnian Serbs might as well have been in a different country. Okay. Like I'm not saying that the, you know, the, the affinity that their co ethnics had for them was mis misplaced. I'm not saying that at all. Like it was not misplaced. But the point is, it was almost it was a totally it was a totally different socio political situation, you know. Like it'd be um, it'd be it, it's it'd be like saying like Jefferson Davis was like was 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 ordering Buddy Bill Anderson to to do things. Yeah, you know, I mean that's like it sounds asinine, but the claim that I just raised is asinine, and people accepted this as oh, Milosevic is a bad guy. And like again, I think I think some some of that's just like you know the, the propaganda being distilled down in, into the most kind of idiot's caricature of, of reality. But it's also, you know, the problem with assigning legalist legalisms and par, legalism par, legalist paradigms and legalisms the high politics as was done at Nuremberg is it, it creates these perverse sort of narratives. Where there, oh, there's 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 command authorities who are bad actors, you know, and 
they're the proximate cause of conflict and everybody within that chain of command is accountable to this bad actor. Like that's just not reality. You know, um, the, uh, I guarantee you that some of the most hardened Shetniks in, uh, Kraina and in Bosnia and probably never even heard most of it speak in their lives, like even on the radio, you know, like it, he had nothing to do with their conceptual horizon. Other than he was like this remote like boss who in Belgrade, who yeah we like that he's Serbian, but other than that you know it's it's ridiculous you know um, and it's also too I mean basically if you look at the modern Serbian state under Milosevic and now and you look at the modern Croatian state under Tuđman and now like basically. Everything that was suggested to be this kind of like horrible, undemocratic feature of Serbia or what they called Yugoslavia after the secession of Croatia and, um, and uh, Slovenia. I mean, those are basically features common to Croatia. You know, um, there's, there's what we would consider a basically chauvinist, uh, you know, nationalism that, you know, characterized the. Uh, party politics there's a basic distrust of pluralism and uh casting uh candidates who who talked about like you know a multi-ethnic uh croatia were, were were viewed as traitors you know uh bad relations with the west you know and and, and admittedly they had more to do with what the west was doing than what serbia and croatia were doing but um you know consistent economic stagnation you know, reliance on subsidies and, you know, a handful of kind of key, like, national industries. I mean, this is, like, everything they say about Serbia, like, being dysfunctional is, like, a mirror image of the reality in Croatia. So, I mean, there, there's that, too. Like, I, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying it to be punitive. I got, I, I think the Croatians are both great people, and I respect the fact that they've resisted, you know, the, the social engineering regime as staunchly as they have. But you can't you can't cast Serbia in this light, but say, oh, but Croatia's not like that because they're basically mirrors of each other, like structurally, you know. And um, and frankly, Tujman, uh, he was a lot different than Milosevic, and like in terms of his character and in terms of like his background, like we talked about in the first episode. But he, in terms of, he was no more autocratic than Milosevic was. Like arguably, I mean, Tujman, once the war kicked off, I. Yes, Tujman was elected. Yes, there were fair elections in in Croatia, but I, I don't think he could have been removed like during his you know the the state of active war. Okay, arguably he was like more like like Milosevic was more susceptible, you know, to like removal by due process than Tujman was. So there's I mean there's that too. Like you can't that this attempt to like other like the Serbians is is bullshit. Okay, and uh, I mean I. I had thought that I conveyed that clearly in our previous discussions, but because apparently I didn't, I, I wanted our Serbian Orthodox friends to know that I, I take that very seriously and I'm, I'm not, I'm not disdaining them or their considerations. Um, but it's also too, one of the reasons why Milosevic in his favor, one of the reasons why he enjoyed the, the, the incumbency for 13 years, you know, like, he did implement a market economy in a way that didn't completely crash the, the the country, you know, unlike Yeltsin, for example, he did tolerate multi-party elections. I mean, admittedly, like the political culture was uh, um, exclusively, you know, kind of like Serb centric, but I mean, again, that's appropriate in a national democracy. Um, there was, a, there was an actual opposition, you know, they did have media access, um, I mean, this wasn't uh, like all the kind of all the kind of poll stars that these NGO types claim like constitute, you know, like a democratic state we approve of. Like he met those. OK, I mean, it, Serbia is a hell of a lot more free than Israel is. I'll tell you that much. I mean, if that's, you know, if, if that's any if, if that's the metric. You know, you can't you, you can't claim that it was it was like Saddam's Iraq or, or or like it was this dictatorship or something. You know, I mean, it basically one of the reasons why, again, like Reagan's people and then Bush's people initially Milosevic was their guy is because he was basically doing he was basically acting like a 
uh, like a post-communist, uh, like European politician is supposed to act, you know. Um, so this, the fact he was hailed into the Hague, you know, I think, but you know, he 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 died when he was on trial, and I, but I, I thought he acquitted himself very honorably. Um, you know, I, I like, and we'll, and we'll get into that in the um, in the bookend episode. Um, I think uh, that's about all I got for today. Like, frankly, I, I don't mean to be a I don't mean to be a uh, an F A or P H A G G O T, but I'm in a lot of pain right now. <laughs> no problem. But we'll, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem at all. Just uh, hit hit up whatever you want to promote, and uh, yeah, we'll get out of here. No, it's great. Thank you, Pete. Um, you can find me on Substack, real Thomas seven 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 dot Substack dot com. I'm happy to report too. Antelope Hill Publishing. They're dear friends of mine, and they publish some really incredible books. And um, I hope to publish with them in the future. Um, but uh, I'm uh, participating in their uh, in their uh, in their creators program, whereby um, if you uh, if you enter my code when you order from Antelope Press, like regardless of the size of the order, you get five percent off. Um, the code is lowercase three T H R E E seven S C V E N number five. And not only, not only will you get 5% off, but like I get a kickback from that too. So that helps my brand. So just keep that in mind. You can find all the info on the sub stack. I posted up a, a little piece about it. You can find me on Twitter at real capital r e l r e a l underscore number seven h o m a s seven 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 you can always find me on my website um it's thomas seven 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 dot com that's number seven h o m a s seven 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 dot com you can find me on youtube at thomas tv number seven h o m a s tv i'm uploading some like videos i shoot just kind of like out and about and with some of the people I talk to and things. So that's going to, I'm hoping that's going to pop a little more as I upload more stuff, but that's what I got. All right. Until the next time. Thank you.